It's mostly quiet on Muriel Court, but that wasn't the case in 1966 when Robert Kim, his wife Helen, and young daughter Joy found gagged, stabbed, and shot to death. Safer politically to leave it alone. Who killed the Sims family in Tallahassee, Florida on October 22, 1966? Check out the new podcast, Massacre on Muriel Court, an in-depth, serialized podcast about this cold case. Subscribe now on whatever platform you get your podcasts. Moronic is the word that comes to mind. He's accusing two top officials of a cover-up. Standing back there under the banana tree. Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime. Unsolved mysteries. Missing people. Creepy places and every now and then an urban legend. If you'd like to support our show and get a bunch of extra Paradise After Dark content, sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. Also, don't forget to swing by our website and check it out. Yes, our website, paradiseafterdark.com. On the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived episodes, mailing list, merch store, links to our social medias, and of course, our Patreon. We got some great little lightweight hoodies on there too, I think, don't we? Yes. I love those. That, the one I wear- Perfect for Florida. I know. It's like not too heavy. It's perfect. So go by there and check it out. Also, while you're there, we have a little virtual tip jar. So if you swing by there at the website, drop some coins in the tip jar and we'll give you a shout out on the show. And this will be the last day, today, Monday, October 31st, the last day to give us a tip in the tip jar and have it donated directly to the Florida Disaster Fund, which is helping our community, Southwest Florida, who's been pretty devastated by Hurricane Ian. We're giving all of our tips this month to the uh, Florida Disaster Fund. I couldn't think of a better place to put money right now. These people need some help. We've heard some horror stories and seen some horrific sights. So, Right. Speaking of horrific sights... Lauren, tonight's case. Tonight's case isn't really a case. It's it, We're going to talk about a haunted city. It's Halloween. It's Halloween. Oh, God. And supposedly this is in, in the top five most haunted cities in the entire country, if not number one, depending on which website you're reading. So St. Augustine, Florida... Beckons visitors with its historic charm, dominating fortress, and even archaeological park that claims to be the original location of Ponce de Leon's very own Fountain of Youth. It is also considered one of the most haunted cities in America. St. Augustine, Florida was founded by Spanish Admiral Pedro Menendez de Aviles, Florida's first governor, on September 8, 1565. It is the oldest continuously inhabited European established settlement in the continental United States. The city served as the capital of Spanish Florida, or La Florida, for over 200 years. It was designated as the capital of the British East Florida when the colony was established in 1763. Great Britain returned Florida to Spain in 1783. Spain gave up Florida to the United States in 1819. In 1589, Italian mapmaker Giovanni Battista Boazio published his map of the raid of Sir Francis Drake on St. Augustine three years earlier. The map is the first documented archival reference to a wooden watchtower at the end of Anastasia Island. The watchtowers were erected by the Spanish crown during the building of the Castillo de San Marcos to keep enemy ships from taking Anastasia Island. The watchtower at the north end of the island eventually became the St. Augustine Lighthouse, which brings us to our first haunted story. 
Yes, the famous lighthouse. On the coast of Florida, where the Talamado and Tanzas rivers spill out into the waters of the Atlantic, stands one of America's oldest and most haunted structures, the St. Augustine Lighthouse. The St. Augustine Lighthouse began guiding ships at sea into shore in 1874, and as it stands today, it is the oldest brick structure in the city. Now, according to Ghost City Tours' website, you may not see it at first, but it's there. Looking up at its twisted black and white striped base, cap of blood red crown, you can almost sense it that something is off, but it isn't until you've run your fingers along its coquina walls and a mixture of limestone and broken shells that you can really feel it. What the centuries and the salt have carved out like ancient ruins holds memories. The lighthouse was originally built in 1824 and was originally owned by a man named Dr. Alan Ballard. Now, Dr. Ballard was forced to sell the lighthouse to the state of Florida in 1865 for a ridiculously low price. Florida's money was depleted after the Civil War, and they offered to buy the lighthouse for significantly lower than its real value. And Ballard refused the offers, and the state threatened to take the lighthouse from Ballard without giving him anything at all. Now, Ballard was outraged and vowed never to leave the lighthouse, and a lot of people say he stuck to his word on that, and he's supposedly been seen on and around the property. Well, one of the first lighthouse keepers was a man named Peter Rasmussen. Peter was known for his meticulous eye and watchful manner of maintaining the lighthouse. He was also known to always be smoking a cigar. Over the years, the smell of Peter's cigar has been detected by many, including staff members and guests. Also, Lauren, there was another lighthouse keeper named Joseph Andro, and it is said that he is still hanging around the tower as well. Now, Joseph died in 1850 when he was painting the top of the tower and fell to his death. It is said that his spirit can be seen leaning over and looking down from the top of the tower. Even more eerie, some have even claimed to have heard the screams of a man falling to his death. According to HauntedRooms.com, the most popular ghosts in the lighthouse are those of the 13-year-old and 15-year-old daughters of Hazika Pity. Pity was commissioned to renovate the lighthouse and he brought his family down with him from Maine. One day... His two young daughters, Mary and Eliza, were playing on the ground and, despite their father's warning, climbed onto a cart which was used to carry building materials from the bay to the lighthouse. Both of the girls drowned when the cart broke loose and slid into the bay. When you visit the lighthouse today, you just might hear two little girls laughing late into the night. The elder pity girl can be seen wearing her favorite blue velvet dress and blue hair bow. Inside the lighthouse and around the property, many are often spooked by strange and eerie events that cannot be explained. Staff members say they lock the doors at the top of the tower each night before leaving, yet the door is often open in the morning when they arrive for work. The lighthouse staff also report that chairs have been moved or overturned and that various items in the gift shop have been moved or missing only to reappear later. And one staff member claims that the lighthouse keeper's cottage is more haunted than the lighthouse itself. The ghosts in the cottage have chased away at least one former lighthouse keeper by scaring him with footsteps, voices, and lights that went on and off constantly. They say a man who hung himself on the porch still haunts the cottage. A woman and a small girl can be seen in the yard when there is a storm approaching. A negative presence is sensed there. Some people feel oppressed when they are in the basement. A man is often seen there who just passes visitors without even giving them a glance. That brings us to the old jail, sometimes called the authentic old jail. Now, this historic jail served the city of St. Augustine from 1891 to 1953. This jail is listed on the Florida and National Register of Haunted Places. The building was designed and constructed by the P.J. Pauley Jail Building, and Manufacturing Company of St. Louis, Missouri in 1891. Its construction was financed by Henry Flagler, who struck a deal with the county for $10,000 because the former jail building stood on land that Flagler needed for the construction of his Ponce de Leon Hotel. The facility would not only house inmates, but also the sheriff and his family. Inmates only lasted about two years in the old jail before dying from infection violence, illness, malnutrition, or hanging. The females in the jail got it the worst. 
They were sexually assaulted by the male prisoners and the guards and pimped out as sex workers. The only time a doctor ever visited the place was on hanging days. Cholera, tuberculosis, and hundreds of other diseases ran rampant throughout the jailhouse. One can only imagine how horrific the living conditions would have been in a non-air-conditioned dungeon in Florida in the summer. Ew. Exactly. Now, eight documented hangings were carried out on this site, and there were many other deaths that can only be described as unnatural. Now, the prison is said to be haunted by an inmate, Charlie Powell, who beheaded a man who spread a rumor about his wife and died particularly slow death on the gallows. Now, another ghostly resident is Sim Jackson, who was hanged in 1908 after murdering his wife with a straight razor in 1906. They moved things along quickly back then. Now, others claim it is something far more vile and sinister, a collective residue and leftover of all the cruelty, a concentrated mass of like pure evil, distilled hatred, savagery, and lust. Hey everyone, guess what? What? Paradise After Dark will be featured in the month of November in the True Crime Calendar. There's a True Crime Calendar? Yes, and you can order it on podcastcalendars.com and use our promo code PARADISE for 10% off. And guess what else? What? There's also a pre-sale going on from now until November 30th for an additional 10% off. That's awesome. That'd make an awesome Christmas gift, actually. I know, right? Podcastcalendars.com. Use code PARADISE. And welcome back. Let's continue with more hauntings in St. Augustine, Florida. It is a creepy place. The St. Francis Inn. Constructed in 1791, the St. Francis Inn is reportedly the oldest inn in St. Augustine. There have been countless supernatural reports on the premises, including flashing lights, loud noises, flickering appliances, scattered belongings, Items dry when they should be wet, moving pictures, and visible apparitions. Well, there's even mention of a young bride that was awakened by a passionate kiss, and she looks over and sees her husband still asleep next to her. Oh, that's creepy. Yeah. According to the inn's own website, stfrancisinn.com, some believe that the ghost of a young house servant haunts the St. Francis Inn. She's become known as Lily, and strange happenings reported in one third floor room led to it being named Lily's Room. A story is told of a young man who lived with his uncle, Major William Hardy, who owned the inn during the middle of the 19th century. He fell in love with Lily, one of the young black servants, believed to have been a beautiful slave woman from Barbados, and they would sneak into rooms of the inn to carry on their secret love affair. When the uncle, a military officer, walked in on the lovers, he dismissed the servant and ordered his nephew to never see her again. The nephew, deeply depressed, killed himself, some say by hanging himself in either the attic, Lily's room on the third floor, or others say he jumped from the third floor window. For years, inn guests and employees have reported apparitions of the ghost in Lily's room and in other parts of the inn. Some say they have seen her passing in the halls, dressed all in white. Whew, just talking about it kind of gave me the, the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> yes. Okay, so now the next stop we're going to make on the tour is Scarlett O'Hara's, also known as the Ghost Bar. Now, it's a regular stop on nearly every ghost tour in perpetually haunted St. Augustine and has been called the most haunted bar in Florida. Now, according to Ghost City Tours, Scarlett O'Hara's was built in 1870 as a private residence. Now, George Colley commissioned the establishment for his fiancée, a woman named Scarlett. The residence was her wedding gift. What a great gift. Now, yet George discovered that Scarlett had forsaken him for another man. This was a soldier stationed at Fort Marion. It was a sordid affair scandalizing St. Augustine. She left George, but she asked her new love to continue checking in on him because he had taken to drinking in anguish. So, he, well, of course he did. You know, I mean, what else are you going to do when the woman of your dreams leaves you and you already gave her this fancy place? <laughs> now, George met a different woman soon after, though their affections were short-lived. He showered her with the spoils of marriage, moving her into the home meant for... <clears throat> he showered her with the spoils of marriage, 
and even moving her into the home meant for his first fiance. Not long after, without warning, George was found lifeless in his bathtub. Scarlett's boyfriend is actually the one who found him. Foul play was suspected, and George's death was sensationalized. Some thought that his first fiancé was involved in his untimely end, yet they lacked evidence. Others suggested suicide, though this too was unlikely. So does George Coley frequent his former residence? Maybe. Guests of the ghost bar have heard the sounds of splashing water and low groans. Another male presence has been spotted on the first floor. He pulls out bar stools, sits, and then vanishes. The staff at the ghost bar claim that glasses move across the bar on their own, the radio turns on by itself, and at least one employee was locked in the bathroom once. Well, I am sad to report that a failure to negotiate a new lease has actually caused the ghost bar to be permanently closed as of July of this year. Oh, I didn't know that. So, now here's a question that I want I want to pose to you, Lauren. If there are new owners, do you think this could possibly stir up some more paranormal events if any re- renovations are performed? Well, they say that a lot of times with paranormal activity, renovations can ramp up activity. That's what I'm saying. So, if new owners come in and reopen the ghost bar and maybe change it up a little bit, there's a possibility that all of these these uh, paranormal activities could, like you said, ramp up some. Yeah. We'll have to see. We'll have to go there when it reopens. I'm excited. I want to go. I want to go like visit every one of these places. <laughs> well, we've got connections to St. Augustine. We do. So we can definitely go at any time. <laughs> All right. Next on our list is Flagler College, believe it or not. Formerly the Ponce de Leon Hotel, there have been many reported ghost sightings at Flagler College. The Ponce de Leon Hotel, the centerpiece of Flagler's campus, was built in 1888 by eccentric entrepreneur Henry Flagler, the man who almost single-handedly turned Florida into a tourist magnet. And remember, this plot of land was the first jail and had to be cleared to make way for this particular Ponce de Leon hotel. Now, the ghostly residents here include Henry Flagler himself, his second wife, Ida Alicia, who is said to have been mentally unstable, a woman in black, this is believed to be Flagler's secret mistress, a small boy who stomps up and down the hallways, and a random man with a mustache in 20th century clothing of no known origin. He's just there. Now, Flagler College is rated at number five of the top 10 most haunted colleges in America. And this is according to the website collegeconsensus.com. Wow. So Flagler College, haunted. Mm-hmm. Noted. <laughs> Off my list of places to attend. The Tolomato Cemetery. Tolomato is the oldest planned cemetery in the country, dating back to the Second Spanish period. The former site of Tolomato Village, also known as Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe de Tolomato, or or Our Lady of Guadalupe of Tolomato, an 18th century Franciscan Indian mission consisting of Gual Indians from Georgia who converted to Christianity and the Franciscan monks who ministered to them. Tolomato Cemetery was originally the site of a possible namesake river where the Gual lived. Well, before it was converted into the Tolomato, the area was a burial ground for the Gual, so it originally started as a Native American burial ground. The Tolomato Cemetery was continually used as a Catholic-only cemetery by the Menorcans, descendants, and other Catholics through both the Spanish and British regimes and into American control in 1821. So this was used quite significantly. Now, while the last burial in Talamato actually took place in 1892, the cemetery officially closed in 1884 when all cemeteries within the city limits were ordered sealed due to the spread of yellow fever. Now, while there are few more than 100 grave markers in Talamato, there's known to be well over a thousand burials within the cemetery gates. All right, so let's talk about some of the ghosts of the Talamato Cemetery. First, we have James and the Giant Tree, not to be confused with James and the Giant Peach. 
Just beyond the cemetery gates lies a century-old live oak tree that five-year-old James P. Morgan spent days climbing and resting in the crest of its thick, Y-shaped branches. In late November of 1877, James climbed the giant oak, lost his grip, and came crashing down, landing sharply on the consecrated soil of the Tolomato Cemetery. He snapped his neck and died instantly. When James wasn't home for supper, his mother went looking for him. She found his lifeless body. After his passing, James's mother swore she could see her son sitting in the oak, dressed in the white shirt and linen overalls he was wearing when he fell. Many didn't believe her and chalked it up to her just being a grief-stricken mother. But not long after, a handful of locals had no choice but to trust her claims after they too saw the apparition. Children claimed to see a young boy running around, happy and laughing, climbing and sitting in the giant oak and watching them intently. You could just hear like giggling and just fun playing, you know, because yeah. lost in that, that moment just before he fell out of the tree. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of stuff just creeps you out. Now, the next cemetery is called the Huguenot Cemetery in France called Huguenot Cemetery. There actually is a Huguenot Cemetery in France, but since it's America, we just go with full straight out meaning Huguenot or straight out terminology, I guess you could say, <laughs> sounded out Huguenot. Now, the Huguenot Cemetery was built during the yellow fever epidemic. It was open to serve as the final resting place of those in the city who were not Catholic. Now, the living no longer used the Huguenot Cemetery, but the dead still stalked the grounds. Travelers report spirit sightings, cold spots, mysterious orbs. Some even witness these full apparitions, similar to in the Tolomato Cemetery. So, let's talk about the haunting of the Honorable Judge. John Stickney was a staunch Massachusetts attorney who moved to St. Augustine. Although he quickly climbed the ranks to district attorney, state attorney, and judge, not everyone was that impressed with him. To local citizens, he was another opportunist taking advantage of America's oldest city. He died of typhoid in 1881. He couldn't ford the river in the Oregon Trail. Judge Long, a dear friend of Stickney, adopted the Stickney's orphan children and moved them to Washington, D.C. He then sent for Judge Stickney's body to be reburied in D.C., where his family now lived. As he was being exhumed, the guy in charge of the operation got hot and decided to take a nap and carelessly left the casket open. <sighs> Two drunk men were able to steal the judge's gold teeth. Many claim that when you're wandering around the Huguenot Cemetery, you may see a staunch man in a black hat staring back at you. Is the old toothless judge searching for his stolen teeth? Yeah, because the guy fell asleep, got a little nappy poo in the afternoon. I guess so. <sighs> There's also an unidentified 14-year-old girl who is another inhabitant of the Huguenot Cemetery. It's believed that she died after exposure to yellow fever epidemic and her body was left unceremoniously at the old city gates. Now, no one claimed the young girl, and her body was buried in a pauper's tomb. Some claim to see her wandering around the cemetery, bewildered looking, just not with it. Now, others say she wears a wispy white dress, and she's frequently sighted near midnight. So, the witching, that's not the witching hour, is it? I think 3 a.m. is the... Was witching, bewitching? At my age, the witching I, hour. I, 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 I don't brush up on my paranormal lingo, uh, to be honest. Well, at, at my age, the, I'm not involved. In the I, you know hour. what? We haven't done a paranormal case since last Halloween when I went to Villisca, Iowa, and spent the night in the Villisca Axe Murder House. Oh, that's right. That's the, and you guys covered a case there. Yes, that's when you covered a, at at CrimeCon. Exactly. We did it live at CrimeCon, but that was the last time we covered a paranormal case. So. Well, that's good because that way we just you know that's not really what we do too much. Right. Yeah. But it's good to throw it in there. It's I Halloween. love it. It's I Halloween, love it. Yo. Well, you know how it is. I enjoy I enjoy the urban legends and stuff like that. It just it gives you a little bit different look on some things, and you get to talk about different cases or not cases but like scares and frights instead of you know like reality this is like it happened but this is yeah but when you're dealing with the stuff that we deal with on a normal basis that's fact it's there it's real all right let's take a quick break
And we are back. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Next up, we have Castillo de San Marcos, a.k.a. The Fort. Everybody knows The Fort. That Castillo de San Marcos was built between 1672 and 1695, making it the oldest and largest masonry fort in the continental United States. The fort was built to protect the city against foreign invasion. The fortress went through many battles, but the fort has a dark history as a prison for Native Americans, one of which was beheaded as a souvenir. Spirits are said to roam around the fort on the inside and the outside. Yes, the Native American was Osceola. Now, he was the leader and member of the Seminole tribe. A cunning chief, he managed to avoid capture by the military during the Second Seminole War. Now, that was until 1837 when he was tricked into custody with a false truce and then transported to Castillo de San Marcos along with 200 of his own men. Now, the chief had been in poor health before his capture and was suffering from chronic malaria, tonsillitis, and abscesses. Now, one in <clears throat> once incarcerated, prominent physician Dr. Whedon was called to treat Osceola, and the two became incredibly close. And not long after, Osceola and several other Seminoles were transferred to Fort Moultrie in South Carolina. While in South Carolina, only three months after his capture, the Native American leader died of Quincy, an infection in the back of the throat. Surprisingly, Osceola's move to South Carolina didn't disrupt his friendship with Dr. Whedon. The doctor continued to visit him and treat Osceola until his death, and even his family grew to love him. Now, the beautiful friendship took a sinister turn when the doctor decided to honor his friend by severing his head and keeping it as a memento. To preserve the head, the witch doctor placed it in a large jar with alcohol before bringing it to St. Augustine and displaying it in his drugstore. After all the trauma his corpse was subjected to, many believe the chief still haunts the grounds of San Marcos. Visitors often report seeing unexplained shadows walking in the fort, and some claim to have witnessed a headless apparition. And other phenomena include unexpected drops in temperature, sudden chills, and hearing these disembodied voices. Creepy! Don't want to go there at night. I don't want to go there. I saw it. I don't want to sit in the daytime and just look over on the hill and see it. <laughs> Next story we have is of Dolores and Manuel, and this is sort of a love story. Dolores was the wife of Colonel Garcia Marti, who arrived in St. Augustine in 1784. Colonel Marti was assigned an assistant named Captain Manuel Avila. Now, Colonel Marti was a cold man, too occupied with the fort and its soldiers to pay attention to his wife. Neglected and mistreated by her husband, Dolores sought love from another man, Captain Abelo. According to Ghost City Tours, one day, Abelo reported for his daily meeting with Colonel Marti. While shaking Abelo's hand, the colonel took a deep breath and narrowed his eyes in recognition. Marti had just smelled his wife's perfume on the captain uh -oh. and immediately knew they were having an affair. By the next day, both Dolores and Captain Abelo were nowhere to be found. When questioned about Dolores' disappearance, the colonel claimed that she had suddenly become ill and was taken to her aunt's home to recover. He also explained that she would be moving back to Spain to live with family. When questioned about the whereabouts of Captain Abela, the colonel claimed he was sent to Cuba on special assignment. According to the legend, many years later, a local man with an interest in architecture uncovered a hidden secret while exploring the fort. He was walking when he heard hollow sounds coming from one of the walls. After removing a few bricks, he exposed a hidden cavity within the fort and illuminated it with his lantern. Inside, he found the skeletal remains of two individuals chained to the wall. He soon realized who they were, missing lovers Dolores and Manuel. Well, that's not a love story at all. Since then, many who visit Castillo de San Marcos report the smell of perfume and a chill in the air while in the dungeon. And a thunder roll. In extreme cases, some have even felt like someone was touching them and report becoming nauseous for no apparent reason. Other accounts tell sightings of a soldier dressed in period clothing looking out to the vast sea. See, stories like that just have like this hang time. You know, they just... When they, when something like that occurs, it just like the story sticks. And when you go there and you know it, it's like it makes it even more eerie, for lack of a better term. 
Okay, so next up on the tour, the Spanish Military Hospital. It was 1821 when the city of St. Augustine had to replace several water lines under the Spanish Military Hospital. Now, during the construction, a startling discovery was made, thousands of human bones. It seems that the hospital was built on top of a Timucuan burial ground. Now, the Timucua were a group of Native Americans who lived in a current-day southern Georgia and northern Florida before this continent was even discovered. This goes way back. Yeah, way back. This is the way back machine. Now, even before the remains were on Earth, workers and patients inside the hospital reported an evil spirit roaming the wards. Now, other reports include hearing cries and screams of patients dying within the hospital rooms, even though no one was in sight. That will send chills up your spine. Now, some say they could even hear conversations going on, although the voices seemed hushed or, like, distant, far away. See, I've heard things like that. Yeah. Now, and many of the guests say they could see an imprint on the bed in one of the rooms as if someone was lying on it. Now, that is the stuff that scary movies are made of. I think that hospitals in general, whether they be new hospitals or old ones that are buried on top of Native American burial grounds, I think they're all creepy. There's a lot of energy there. Yes. Yeah, that's, some I think good, that's, some bad. I think that's the best way to put it instead of creepy. like There's just a lot of energy. Yeah, good there. energy and bad energy. So, yeah, the, you might see a little bit of everything. So, so question for you. Lauren. Yes. What's your thoughts on some of the the spiritual stuff, the the ghost, if you will? What are my thoughts on that? That that's that that's too much of a vast question. I know it was very open. I was I was trying to lead you into something and just let Do you I walk with it. Do I believe in ghosts? Is that what you're asking me? Sort of. You know, I didn't want to say it like that because it's like you know. Do you believe in magic? Okay. Um, that reminds me of the movie American Pie. I don't like the word ghosts. I, I I prefer the term spirit. And yes, I do believe spirits exist. And I do believe that spirits can communicate with us and we can hear them and they can hear us. Yeah, I, I like the word energy. That's why I use that word energy because, you know, so energy, they say energy can't be, you know, created or destroyed. So I think that the energy is there. I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't want to fall victim to the Oh, well, they're just not done yet. They've got work to do here or they're trapped in the, you know, I just think the energy is still here. And like I mentioned earlier, like where the old bar, they're going to renovate that. And I think sometimes that can stir up some of that energy that we talked about. So talking about the energy, if you want to know about some of Lauren and I's occurrences with energy, you can go back to some of our previous Halloween episodes where we talk about our own occurrences within our own home. Yes. That, Some of those. That you would have to go to our website. That's in the archives because that was, I think, our first Halloween episode in 2018. Was that the one with the ghost stories? Yes. Oh, man. Yes. <laughs> that was actually one of the funnest episodes you ever did. Yeah. I, I still, still to this date, it was a really fun episode. And then we ended up getting ghost stories. I mean, we, 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 we reached out to people that we knew. And some listeners, and we got them to contact us and we talked to them. Remember, they were telling us the ghost stories. It was a great episode yeah. for Halloween. So what do you think? What do you think of St. Augustine? Um, I haven't. I've I've been there for short periods of time. Uh, during the day, it's absolutely a beautiful city. There's areas you go to that are just gorgeous. Now, St. Augustine, in and of itself, and you can you can probably testify to this as well. The you think of St. Augustine, you just – most people really generalize that old downtown district. Now, when you're in the downtown district, there's definitely like a, a feel. You know what I mean? Definitely a feel to it. And you can sense that the residents or the business owners, things like that, like you mentioned earlier about turning into a tourist trap. I think when you're downtown, you feel the energy that's there and because the business owners do play on that to hype it up for tourism, it almost like perpetuates it. Would you agree with that? Yeah, maybe. But what's your feeling on it? On on what Saint you Augustine. just said, St. Augustine? Oh, I love it. Yeah, I know you think it's a beautiful place, but I'm saying when you get the whole area, because it's a huge, it's a huge municipality. I mean, it's not just the small little area. It's huge. But downtown, tell me downtown doesn't have a different feel to it. Downtown does have a different feel. It is extremely old. I mean, the the streets are cobblestone. It's definitely got a strange feel to it. I spend a lot of time outside of downtown. 
I spend a lot of time in St. Augustine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, 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 it's my favorite place ever in the whole wide world. <laughs> in even, the whole wide world. Even if it's haunted, the weather is absolutely gorgeous and I just love it there. It is a great part of Florida. But like I said, it's just the downtown area, which is where most of these locations are that we spoke about this evening or this morning, whenever you're listening. It's just, it, it's got definitely got a great feel to it. And you can feel the the age of the place. Yes. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. So definitely hit it up. Definitely hit it up. And there's what's the name of it? Was it Ghost City Tours? They do Ghost this, City Tours. Yeah, yeah, they do a full tour of different places that you can go to. And uh, many of which are mentioned here. So put it on your uh, bucket list. Go visit St. Augustine. Maybe stay at the St. Francis Inn or something. Yeah. In Lily's room. Wendy, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the name of that hotel? The, in the book or in real life? Oh my God! Are we gonna do this con? Are we gonna do this on the mic right now? It's in the book. Okay, what was it in the book? The Overlook Hotel. Okay, what is it in real life? The Stanley Stanley Hotel. Hotel. That's what it is. That's what it is. Wendy, I'm home. I love that. That's my. He was a perfect character for that. So yes. everyone, have a great evening. Happy Halloween. Um, happy belated Halloween. If you're listening to this after Halloween, so Please stay safe. Exactly. Be sure to check your kids' candy take all the good stuff and everyone i just want to tell you that the peanut butter kisses that are in the wax paper and candy corn are the best halloween candies in the whole entire world whole entire world so lauren i guess that's going to be it for tonight unless you want to interject your favorite candy my favorite candy reese's peanut butter cups if you guys want to send us some some halloween candy reese's peanut butter cups no yes no all candy corn no candy all candy corn just reese's Anyway. Hey, I have a question for you. What? Why did the gingerbread man see the podiatrist? Uh, somebody ate his foot. No, he had candy corns. <laughs> okay, everyone. That is it for tonight. If Happy Halloween. If you'd like to support the show, please consider giving our Patreon a try. Patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. Yeah, because uh, on there, you're also going to find the link to Lauren's new show. Massacre on Muriel Court, which is uh, chugging along really well. I'm yeah. really happy. I'm really glad the way it's going. It's it's out now. So make sure you're subscribed and make sure you're listening. It's great. It's a good deep dive. So also be sure to check out our website for links to all of our social media. Uh, like uh, Lauren said, the Patreon, the merch store. Again, sweater season. And make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. And thank you, everyone, for listening to Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.